Good evening, I'd like to call to order the May 25th, 22 regular Planning and Transportation Commission meeting. And we will get to a resolution here on the um, audio and visual and speaking and so on, but uh, can we call the roll please? Yes, Chair Lowey. Present. Vice Chair Suma. Present. Commissioner Chang. Here. Commissioner Hackman. Here. Commissioner Regdal. Here. Commissioner Ruparvar. Here. Commissioner Templeton. Here. We have a quorum. Excellent, thank you. And Assistant Director Tanner, would you like to? I would, unfortunately my computer is just restarting itself um, with all my notes on it. Um, Ms. Kocheva, do you have the meeting ID handy? And I can just pass it to you when we have to say that. Yes. Just wanna say good evening to all the folks who are joining us in the chamber, as well as those who may be online. Um, we are having a hybrid hearing tonight. And so you can participate if you are here at City Hall um, or you can participate online. If you would like to participate, you can join us at zoom.us slash join with meeting ID 916-4155. 9499. Again, that's ID number 916-4155-9499. And when it's time to speak on an agenda item or general public comment, you can raise your hand and you'll be unmuted and you'll be allowed to speak. If you're calling in by phone, you can call 1-669-900-6833. Again, 1-669-900-6833. And again, enter the meeting ID 916-4155-9499. And to speak, if you're on the phone, you can use star nine and you'll be raised, your, your, your hand will be raised here and we'll unmute you so you can share your comments. And if you are in the chamber and you'd like to speak on an item on the agenda or an item not on the agenda during oral communications, please submit a speaker card um, to the uh, to Ms. Klusheva who is here on my right. And that is uh, all for this evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the next item is uh, oral communications. If there's anyone in chambers or online that would like to speak on an item that is not on tonight's agenda, now would be the time to raise your hand and we'll call and allow you to speak on that item. I haven't received any speaker cards. We have online one online attendee, but I don't see that he raised his hand. He hasn't raised his hand. Okay, just gonna give him another minute. I don't either, so <clears throat> that's the end of oral communications. Are there any agenda changes, additions, or deletions? There are no changes from staff. None from staff, none from commissioners. No changes. And now the yeah, I think, uh, did we do the roll call? Sorry if I missed that. Yes, we did. Okay, yeah. and I think um, Commissioner Templeton, if it's just for the benefit of all the commissioners may be leaving and then re rejoining the hearing later on. Is that correct, Commissioner Templeton? I am, uh, just wanted to let you guys know. So thanks for giving me an opportunity. Um, I will have to step out and be back uh, and I'll let Ms. Tanner know uh, when I'm on so that uh, everyone knows when I'm back. Thank you. Great, okay. thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so now it's time for the uh, assistant director's report. Good evening, everyone. Thank you again for being here. And sorry, my computer is restarting, which is great. It's, it's on, um, but my notes are not before me. Um, so I'll do a little bit from memory this evening. Not a ton of updates. Um, the council is heading into its last month of meetings um, before the summer recess. Castilea was heard this past Monday, but was continued until June 6th. And so that will be another uh, meeting of the city council on Castilea. Uh, June 1st, which is a Wednesday, is also going to be a council meeting. There's no council meeting next Monday due to the holiday. So they've scheduled a meeting on the 1st of June, and that will be when the um, PTC work plan is considered, along with the Architectural Review Board and the Historic Resources Board. Um, work plans for the coming year. So that will be happening on Wednesday. And then the following week, I believe is going to be objective standards um, will be uh, also taken up. That was continued from a couple hearings ago at city council. And then um, not related specifically to the work of this body, but I think of importance for the work 
uh, towards helping house all Palo Altans. The city will be taking up a home key um, project. That's a project to build a non-congregate shelter in the city of Palo Alto, and that should be coming up in June, um, making great progress. And we're very hopeful that we will be getting a grant award soon. Um, so keep your fingers crossed that that will um, continue to go forward. Those are the items that are coming up. And in other news in the department, um, we are gonna be hiring a few new planners. So those um, interviews have happened and we're hopeful to have a few new current planners. So you might see some new faces here at the PTC. Um, and we're very, very excited about those opportunities. And then of course, in June, the city council will be taking up the budget, which may give us opportunity for some additional positions if those are all approved. So um, work continues. And I don't know if Mr. Ruiz is on the line from transportation if he had anything he wanted to add um, updates from the office of transportation he is hello chair and commissioners um rafael arias senior transportation engineer and i don't have any official um updates right now but i'll just to announce i'll be participating in in these in most in all the ptc meetings coming up and welcome to take any questions you have and also be updating you on ongoing transportation efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Do any commissioners have uh, questions for the assistant director? There's one light on, but it must be a ghost light. So no. Okay. All right, then we'll move to our first, uh, item uh, of the evening, which is a study session on the parking program update. And we'll go to a staff report on that. Thank you. We have Mr. Nathan Baird with the Office of Transportation who will be giving that um, presentation. Good evening, commissioners. I am just going to share my screen. Um, I want to make sure I share the right screen. All right, are folks uh, looking at my screen now? I don't think it's no. showing yet. Okay, let me try again. All right, how's that? That works. All right, so um, good evening. The, tonight's presentation is um, largely supplemental to the report that you received. And you know we're welcome to have um, discussion and feedback on, on any of the items or um, information in, in both. Um, this is kind of a, re, a brief kind of overview of the last several years of parking planning efforts. Um, we had a couple downtown um, studies specifically, um, 2016 and 2017. Um, some, of the re, some of the recommendations that came out of that really recommended some um, residential parking program improvements as well. Um, so we've been utilizing a, the, a permit and citation management contract um, to, to to advance many of the efforts that we um, planned for from those original studies. Um, so that RFP was one, went out in 8, 2018, 2019, we brought on Duncan Solutions and we've been um, transitioning to the Duncan Solutions portals um, since um, resuming our programs um, following the initial um, phases of the pandemic. Um, last year, um, we really, made significant pro progress on kind of advancing many of the changes that were originally set out in those um, studies. Um, we're re really using um, automated license plate recognition for um, both cost efficiencies and also data collection um, automation that we're looking to set up. Um, we'll also be publishing um, to our website some more um, permit sales data and parking occupancy data. Once we have those established, the permit sales data is coming in now for all our programs, um, but we're still using the LPR to establish the parking occupancy data. So we don't have that much data on that yet. Um, the next kind of big efforts coming up um, are some additional Unicode, Unicode updates. 
Um, last time we brought Unicode updates to the PTC, um, you all recommended that we really focus in on the virtual permitting um, part of that update. Um, but there's some additional updates that we're looking to do um, related to commercial um, parking and um, some additional um, residential improvements we want to accomplish. Um, virtual per permitting, you know, while we've it's been in many ways advantageous, um, seven eighths of our permits in downtown are now digital. Um, it's been a little bit difficult for some of our users. Over there on the right is a screenshot of what kind of the that portal looks like. Um, so we'll be working closely to um, try to improve that experience for many of our customers. Um, the other big kind of question that will be away from the physical guest visitor hang tag um, for efficiency, it's just not really efficient for our uh, vendors to have to kind of check that visually. Um, so right now, but right now we do have kind of a hybrid system where it's first, we have both virtual permits and um, physical hang tags for guests and visitors. Um, on the commercial side in both our downtown and Cal Ave um, areas, you know, one of the major pain points that we, we could potentially hope to relieve is the fact that after a two or three hour parking stay, it costs $25 um, to visit or spend a day in downtown. Um, so we'll look, be looking with the Municode update to give some options for, for um, paying hourly um, and potentially in our garages or lots or as those are, those are a little bit easier for us to deal with. Um, but we're also potentially looking at doing an RFI to get a technology vendor to also do some on-street um, options or have some options for us to move forward there. Um, with our parking action plan, um, what we're really doing is kind of advancing these um, key strategies to to improve the experience for both um, visitors and residents, um, improving um, our data um, management, and then also um, improving and centering customer experiences are our, our top parts or key parts of that. Um, here's some of the sales data that we've recently got um, since resuming um, in 20, late 2021 for um, some of our smaller programs. And then also the, the, the new sales data for our 2022 programs that have started this year, um, including downtown. Um, so we've sold over um, nearly 2000 um, parking permits in the downtown area. Um, both the University Avenue and the California Avenue area um, garages and lot permit sales are significantly down compared to previous years. Um, so in previous years, both the University Avenue and California Avenue parking um, garages and lots have sold out the permit availability. Um, and so while we did increase our permit availability um, to help kind of prioritize or steer customers that way, th those permits have not sold out just yet. Um, so you can see California down at the bottom, the CA employee, that's California Avenue employees, um, that's about 30% of permits available have been sold out um, in the University Avenue. Um, roughly half of the permits available in the garages and lots have been sold out. Um, again, major parking initiatives. We're going to continue to um, launch digital purchase options. Um, we're looking to um, add the California Avenue to the portals um, this early this fall. And we're going to continue to have some engaged stakeholders in conversation about um, some of the previous um, work plan items to kind of smooth out our residential programs and also offer offer some different additional permit types in the commercial zones. Um, in terms of process, um, we'll be coming to the PTC a lot more frequently now as a program um, to kind of continue to make progress and continue to review with you all um, progress on our parking data portal. Um, and just kind of public, better public understanding of our, our parking initiatives. Um, most of our um, major changes that we'll have to do, we'll also have to go to finance because um, there are some budget considerations as well with thinking about um, commercial pilots, um, but we'll get to some of that um, next time when we bring some more um, developed options. Again, um, you know, we're really, having the study session today, just to kind of give you guys a, a chance to kind of review progress made so far, um, talk to us about who we might need to work with moving forward, 
Um, we will, I do want to schedule kind of the in park in person parking facilities um, walking tour um, pretty soon and would be interested in having um, some PTC members participate in that if interested. Um, and we'll also be developing a customer survey um, that will eventually have PTC review as well. All right, that kind of concludes this kind of brief update. I'm happy to ask, um, have conversation or um, answer any questions or um, have further discussion on any of the points in either the, um, the packet or in the presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, we could have general round of questions for the staff report before we go to any general round of public comment. So whoever like to, would ever like to comment, uh, please light up. <clears throat> I have screens and lights as usual, so I'll do my best not to ignore anyone. Uh, Commissioner Heckman. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Baird, for the uh, report and the, the written report as well. I just had a a uh, quick question on packet page nine, one of the uh, recent accomplishments was to launch the online permit portals for all six residential preferred permit sales cycles. And I just wanted a little uh, better understanding on the sales cycles. Are these staggered through the year um, and are they annual? Uh, you know, what is the sales cycle? Yeah, so that for the residential permits in particular, those are all annual permits and they are staggered throughout the whole year. Um, so we, we've been launching the permit portals as, we bring it, as we've been bringing the um, programs back online um, following the brief period during the pandemic when they were um, shut down. Thank you. Um, yeah. Commissioner Chang. Thank you, Mr. Baird, for your part. I've got three questions. Uh, we'll do the sh shortest, easiest one first. So on package page, packet page 10, where there's a listing of the strategies currently underway for fiscal 2022. Yes. Is it expected that everything above future policy and action items two are these just things that are being thought about and started? So these are all things that are being thought about, started in progress, um, not necessarily completed by the following year. So some of, some of the efforts will continue, definitely continue into future years. Um, you know, particularly thinking about like adding APGS systems to some of the garages. You know, Public Works will have a project um, that will do you know one or two garages in the downtown. Um, you know, and then we've got the micro transit pilot project coming online, so we'll adopt some tie-ins as we can. Um, but yes, many of these we could continue to be working on in, into the future. Okay, so then a follow-up question on that specifically around the APGS systems. Um, we do anticipate that sometime in fiscal 22, we, there would be completion of at least one or something. So we would see something actually installed this year? Is that not, not, not the completion or not even necessarily the installation, but okay. we are working with Public Works right now on um, getting the RFP out. Um, so the request for proposals um, for, for additional options. Okay, got it, thank you. And then um, I had a couple bigger picture questions. So um, on packet page nine, you listed a whole bunch of act actions that have been completed since the last PTC update. And so I wanted to get a sense from you. Do you feel like you're ahead of schedule, on schedule? or behind schedule in terms of what you've managed or what what has been done relative to what was planned? Yeah, so I think, you know, we've made a lot of progress on um, addressing some of the original uh, residential concerns about our parking permit programs. Um, so there had, in the beginning, there was some consternation <clears throat> in particular that the, um, that the on-street residential permits were in fact um, cheaper than the garage and lot permits. Um, and so that was kind of a residential con consternation that you know, the garage and lots appeared to be you know, not as good a deal. Um, so we've adjusted that, that kind of um, imbalance. Um, there was also some consternation that you could get a low income permit in the RPP zones, but you could not get that in the garages and lots. So that has been addressed. 
Um, so we've kind of, we've tackled these kind of major, um, you know, issues that were con causing some consternation amongst our, our um, most important advocates. Um, you know, next up is really doing some improvements for the customer service experience. Um, there's been a little bit of um, trouble with some of our customers transitioning to the new virtual system. Um, so we're, we'll, we will really be looking for ways to improve that experience for them. Um, and then, you know, where we're a little behind is just implementing the, getting the automated occupancy counts set up. It's taken us a little bit of time to kind of figure that out, um, coordinating amongst all the vendors involved to get that set up and automated. Um, but we do expect that to get going pretty soon. Um, the getting, getting just the enforcement set up and um, getting our hybrid system set up has taken a little bit longer than we um, anticipated. But um, we are now doing LPR enforcement. Um, our contract vendors are utilizing the, um, the LPR devices that we purchase to enforce and check against our customer list. And then where their um, particular overstays on particular vehicles that don't have that on file, um, then they will visually check for whether there's a physical hang, hang tag or not. Got it. Thanks. Um, and then my last question is sort of what have you learned um, with all of the, you know, when you came to speak to us last, you talked about we're, we're just going to start rolling out the automated license plate readers. We're kind of starting it here. Um, so I'm wondering with all the new stuff that has happened, online sales, automated license plate readers, anything else that's been done, what have you learned from the pilots um, that, that, that you've taken away that you're gonna implement uh, for the future? Yeah, so I think, you know, certainly there's still more for us to learn as we keep going through, um, but thus far, um, you know, we have eight different programs and it's been a bit of a learning curve for me to learn the ins and outs of all those different eight programs that have been set up you know, individually over time. Um, you know, our Crescent Park College Terrace programs are the oldest. Um, and so over time, ways of approaching some of these problems or um, that we're trying to address with these programs can change or you know, new best practices can take place. So we really, the, way, the thing that I've learned most now is that, um, you know, there's certain real advantages and disadvantages to the, the fact that we have so many programs. So we've been making some progress toward um, consolidating um, at least the options available um, so that it's just easier for staff and for our vendors to communicate with the public about what the op options are in terms of what permits are available. Um, but there is also some real benefit in being able to have, um, you know, we've been going through each of the districts kind of a couple at a time. Um, so there's some been some benefit in terms of approaching it a little bit at a time incrementally in terms of being able to learn um, program program as we kind of upgrade and try to improve things. Okay, um, could you just, you, you mentioned a couple of times that some people are having trouble migrating to the online system. What types of challenges are you finding? I'm just trying to get a little bit more specific just to get a yeah. sense. I mean, yeah. you're not, not an exhaustive list, but just some examples so that to give some color to what that is. Yeah, so, so it's, some of it's pretty basic stuff in terms of, you know, we have to, you have to get an online account set up with an email. Um, so if you're not too email savvy, that can be a little bit difficult in terms of needing to check your spam account sometimes for something, or, you know, sometimes there's a CAPTCHA that may not have been interacted with appropriately. Um, and then the other kind of issue that some folks have is just with uploading the documentation that's required. So we require a driver's license for every single permit. And then we also require if that, um, if your address on your driver's license doesn't match, then you have to oh do something gosh. else. Um, and so sometimes the, the uploading requirements can be a little bit difficult for people. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to make that a little bit more um, obvious for folks. Okay, thanks. That definitely helps provide some color. Thanks. Uh, before we get too deep, there's only two uh, attendees. Let's just see if either one of those want to speak to this issue in public comment. Mr. Montague or Ms. Van Dorn, who are attendees. Oh, okay, fine. All right, no one, no one, no one wants to speak on this topic. That's just 
I want to make sure that we were hearing any public comment as we were having our study session. So there aren't. So let's continue. Um, uh, Commissioner Rechtal. Yeah, a real basic question. You mentioned we have eight different areas. They all have the same rules. You know, they're all 24 hours a day. And how long can visitors park without a permit in each of the areas? Does that differ? So that, for the most part, differs. Um, we have the um, a no one no overnight parking program in Crescent Park. Um, so that's that's a no overnight restriction. All the other um, six of our residential programs are two hour restrictions in neighborhoods um, where there have been um, commercial impacts in the past and studied commercial impacts. Um, and then we have the two um, kind of commercial public garage uh, and lot programs. Uh, so those are the major differences, the garage and lot programs, the no overnight programs, and then the, um, the residential programs. And how do we come up with the rules? You have public outreach and then you just kind of guess on what the public wants. So each of the previous um, programs, particularly the older ones, had a, a really thorough um, public process for each of them. Um, the most recent one, um, well, actually all, all of the programs are set up by a similar process now, um, but we are trying to kind of stream that a little bit with the Muni code update that we'll be bringing in the future. Um, but yeah, the old Palo Alto one is the newest one. Um, so each of them has, you know, is addressing slightly different um, impacts in terms of the commercial encroachment that they would have seen in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but also we know that much of that data that was collected originally um, probably has likely changed um, and the impacts have likely changed and what the impacts will be in the future could likely change. Um, and so that's why we've really been prioritizing the um, automating the parking occupancy count so that we could have an ongoing measure of um, the impact on parking availability that our, uh, our efforts are having. Um, but we really wanna ground any future conversation about adjustments needed or you know, how, what further um, changes might be needed um, based on that data that we, that we will be. And do we go through and do surveys and see how people, how satisfied they are with parking programs? So that's been one of the key kind of recommendations that was in the previous work plan is that we develop something like that. Um, there was a previous suggestion to use um, this national survey tool that was potentially available to us. Um, we've still got some other options and we haven't, we've been trying to make progress just on getting the data reported out first, but we do um, hope to have that customer um, feedback tool in place as well soon too. And we think we can implement that. And one of the things with outreach is it can be very time consuming. And yeah, and we've been really trying to um, strategize and be kind of focused about it. And we've been also kind of um, adaptive to what's been going on. You know, it's been a really tough time um, for local businesses. So we've, you know, tried to make our parking outreaches with businesses in particular very targeted and, you know, when, when there is something actually to talk about and converse about. Um, so we'll, we'll be re-engaging on that front soon. Um, as things start to ramp up again in the economy. And in the packet, you mentioned a couple times data-driven policy. And what does that mean? What data do you use to develop a policy? Yeah, so yeah, I think that value has always been with our programs um, because we really wanted to understand that um, our, our, our permit programs are really designed to mitigate um, commercial impacts on parking availability for many of our residents. That's the, the, kind of the major part. Um, we're also in the downtown areas kind of managing demand from different types of users that have different types of impacts. Um, so that's why we've got employee permits available, but we also have, you know, the daily visitor permits available. Um, and, you know, really um, those are all designed with pretty thorough um, engagement strategies from the beginning. What we're now planning for and figuring out how to do is, you know, have some continued metrics that we're monitoring over time, um, and then also have facilitate an ongoing discussion about the success of the programs. Um, and so that's kind of where we're, previously, you know, it was always a planning process and then a program is instituted. Now we need to kind of continue to do ongoing monitoring and ongoing adjustments as needed and establish some processes and uh, metrics for that. Okay. So when we look at a neighborhood, do we know how many people live in that neighborhood and how many cars are registered in that neighborhood and how many parking spots are in that neighborhood? 
So, you know, we don't know those exactly, but we have some estimates, um, you know, and, you know, sometimes a different number of cars can park on a block, you know, based on, you know, who, who parks closer together or not different days. Um, but we do the automated um, license plate reading technology will allow us to have a count of all the vehicles vehicles in a particular geographic area for an AM or a PM count. Um, and that's the, the, we'll be using those as the basis for establishing our ongoing um, estimates of the parking occupancy and parking availability. Um, and then it'll, it'll involve um, some visual checks um, of, you know, if we count this many cars on a, on a street, we want, we'll also need to have someone visually check in that car, the parking spots available. Um, and get some estimates of that. But we're gonna basically estimate, get an estimate of the total availability um, so that we can kind of automate those ongoing counts. Okay, very good. I have some more questions that I'll let other people get the first shot. So, thanks. Commissioner Rupavar, I saw your hand up before. Did somebody cover your question or? I, I can go, I just had a quick question. Thank you, Chair Lau. Thank you, Mr. Baird, for your presentation. Could you provide a bit more color into you, what you envision for the shared parking program? Um, a little bit more specific on how it would work. Um, and that. Again, the shared parking is is uh, um, something that you know is kind of a best practice um, for just maximizing the efficiency and usage of the spaces that we have. Um, and there's ways that the city can encourage that with helping folks, helping private um, players kind of understand what types of agreements they could make um, to share parking, um, to save some parking. Um, but again, that's not something that we have um, immediately planned to do any outreach on or make some advancements on. Um, we're kind of, that's kind of pushed off a little bit still. Um, yeah, the midterm, it's for midterm, but I'm just curious, I'm just having trouble envisioning, how does that work? Like you have a tag and you share it, like you have a space and you share it. Like some people use it during the day, some use it at night. Yeah, so there's different arrangements that um, that can be had. W one of the big, big um, ways that the city, you know, can participate or help is just by having um, better and more frequently updated pricing of our own. Um, and that helps, you know, create a market for, for other spaces um, to be utilized more efficiently or, you know, shared more efficiently. Um, but yeah, the way that folks have used it, I've shared parking that I'm familiar with is, um, you know, different time-based needs or, or if different folks have, you know, have more parking than they, you know, currently utilize. Many times uh, a building will be built and X parking identified, but the use changes over time. Um, and so sometimes the parking that's set aside is too much or too little um, and having you know, having a way for people to get to know about that um, can be useful. Um, but there's basically just a different programmatic approaches to it, um, involving agreements with the different players involved and conversation about what the various needs are. So it is kind of a hands-on process sometimes. Would it, are you even envisioning or would it even entail like a public-private partnership? For example, if there's office space and with hybrid work, less people are going um, to the office. So office space now has extra parking and they'll a lot like work with the city is that what you're well I don't know that, that we necessarily want I don't know that we necessarily need to have them work with the city or have the city run a program but it is something that we're interested in trying to figure out how it can move forward so I I guess I don't have a ton of details for we're you just in the idea phase <laughs> it's definitely it kind of a planning it's definitely kind of a planner's um kind of line item right now got it thank you Uh, I had one question. Are you hearing from neighbors or any other sources or your own data that there's other neighborhoods that need attention with regard to RPP or we think that there's not right now? From my understanding that the need is pretty low right now, that there's plenty of parking availability. Um, you know, with the slide that we showed previously with the permit sales, um, permit sales are down in all of the neighborhoods. Um, you know, despite all the changes that we made. Um, so yeah, there, there's plenty of parking availability right now. Um, I will say though, you know, our downtowns do generate parking demand and trip demand. And we, we do see that um, slowly building, um, you know, that we have 
a zone, our zone six in the downtown is our busiest zone. And that zone is already sold out of the employee permits that we made available in that zone. Um, and so on, on street parking is um, in that zone is in high, the highest demand of compared to other, other employee permit availability throughout the city. Um, but generally demand is, is way down right now. Okay, and when you're coming up with these new programs, you're always in in uh, dialogue with um, active members of the community who have been active before and uh, somewhat expert on RPP stuff, right? So when we um, when we added the new OPA of the old Palo Alto district pretty recently, yep. we followed the same processes that we had previously. Um, trying to think, and yeah, it goes through the same process in terms of. Um, going through a public um, engagement period, um, you know, residents really drive the process to add a, to add an area or to add a block to an existing district or to add a new district. Um, both of those processes require um, per, uh, signature gathering, um, and a similar process is how folks can have their uh, have a block removed or have their neighborhood removed from a current district as well. Yep. Okay. Other questions? Uh, Commissioner Rechtel, you had some more, I know. Oh, sorry, uh, Vice Chair Suma. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Baird, for the report. Um, some of my questions have been answered, but I did have a question about the VTA micro transit pilot project. Could you remind us all, or at least me, what that is? Sure, so we received um, a small not a small grant from VTA to operate a micro transit shuttle. Um, we will be putting out that via an RPP or an RFP pretty soon to um, advertise and um, eventually bring on a vendor to provide that service. Uh, and we're hoping that there'll be some opportunities for us to collaborate with them with some of our parking permit programs. So we're still not quite sure what that'll look like, but the RFP will. Um, will be kind of the, the next big step on finding that um, a little bit more clearly and looking at what the options are. Okay, so would that kind of be, uh, would that be like our old shuttle system with regular routes or would it be a more optimized dynamic? Or yeah, so currently the, the goal would be to provide a more um, optimized kind of dynamic service. Um, still, still meant to serve as a link between, you know, Caltrain and El Camino Real to other um, job locations in the, in the city um, and to other kind of places that were served by the previous shuttle. Um, but micro transit is a fundamentally different type of service that you know, doesn't have fixed routes um, and provides more um, point to point uh, trips. Okay, thank you. And then um, could you just briefly um, define curb management, what you mean by that? Yeah, so curb management is kind of the term that we use to talk about um, how we allocate curb space in uh, downtown or commercial areas. There are many different needs and um, types of trips that are facilitated by the curb in a downtown or urban environment. Um, and so curb management is, is the kind of the term we use for um, having, you know, public engagement, public processes, but also um, potentially technologies available in the future to help um, decide how the curb is used, whether it be used for a loading zone, whether it be used for a parking space, whether it be used for a parklet, um, bike corral. Um, so there's many different ways that we use our curb. Um, the future or, you know, some of the innovative things that people are looking at in some of our larger cities are looking at ways of programming the curb space at different times of day, potentially having you know, a loading zone be available in the morning, but go away in the afternoon. Um, at its most basic level though, um, curb management is just having, sometimes having, you know, 20 minute green spaces or, you know, charging a uh, small amount so people could stay longer in a particular location or not. Um, so it's kind of the, the whole, it kind of summarizes a, a whole approach to parking in terms of, um, you know, using, using pricing or using um, different regulations to provide for different trip types. Okay, thank you. And then um, to follow on to uh, the chair's question a little bit, since um, I know that the downtown residential parking program had always had kind of built into it that the 
the zones that were closest to University Avenue were the most desirable. And it sounds like that's the case with zone six. Is there an opportunity now, maybe we would have to adjust this later, but to spread that out a little. And, and um, so zone six is not carrying too much of the burden now and maybe spread it out. Um, I mean, understanding that we don't know the COVID long-term, um, uh, what's gonna happen long-term with working from home and those things, but is there an opportunity there that might give some relief and spread it a little more evenly? Um, I don't know if we're able to spread the demand more evenly. You know, I think zone six is probably going to continue to be one that's um, highly desired as terms of a place to park because they're, you know, there are businesses over in that area um, that don't have near, that don't have as near access to like the garages and lots that are available. Um, but the zone system does in fact help spread around that demand um, by, you know, having a limit on the availability of the spot that's most desired. And then, you know, there are zones that are a little further away that are, um, you know, providing, providing some relief um, for folks who don't, who can't now park in zone six, but, you know, might be willing to walk a little bit longer um, in the, near, the, other, the other zone. So the zones do, the, the intention of the zones is to help spread, our, spread around some of that demand and um, make sure that we're not over parking um, one particular spot. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, let's see. Oh, I was wondering if the shared use, I don't think you answered this. Is that also shared use for um, one site with different uses? Is, are you thinking of that or more the other kind of shared use, which would be, uh, you know, site A doesn't use their parking at night so they could loan it out to others or both? Yeah, I, I would say we're not gonna constrict ourselves on what the shared parking initiative might mean um, just yet. So I would certainly think, you know, all all we'd wanna keep open as many options as possible as we move forward, depending on what um, the local needs are. Okay, okay, that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Commissioner Rectal, do you wanna follow up? Yeah, some more if other people don't wanna cut in. Um, License plate readers, the automation seems uh, very good. Um, is it just going to be used for data or for parking enforcement or are we going to be able to collect data and make policy decisions based on that? Well, the idea will be to, um, you know, do the enforcement, but also to collect regular data so, so that we can, you know, utilize that data as a input on our decision making, certainly. Okay, and so when we take the license plate readers, can we access where that car is registered? Do we, no, the, the whole process. Through, I mean, if I go across the Golden Gate Bridge, they know where I live, right? So there is some way that the state allows DMV data to be um, shared. Is it possible that at least at, for short periods of time, we could do that to understand, for example, if, if you knew where the owner lived, for each of these cars, you could see how far do they have to walk in order to park their car. That would be very good for policy decisions. It also could say, well, how many, this complex, how many people, how many cars is it generating? How much parking demand is it generating? Those would be really good things that conceivably could be done without much labor with license plate readers. Right now we're currently setting it up just to, you know, Anna, get that parking occupancy data. That's kind of the narrowly defined, um, job that we're trying to do. Um, we're not interested in trying to keep much of that data. Um, you know, so the, the processes that we're setting up right now will purposely animize um, much of the stuff that you're talking about. And I also think that, you know, much of the transportation trip data that you're talking about is potentially available other from other data sources other than the LPR data um, and potentially more accurate from those other sources. But again, um, transportation planning data um, is not setting those things up for the types of decisions that you're talking about on broader basis is not exactly non-trivial for us. Okay. Um, and so that's that, that hasn't been the goal um, goal of the LPR data. Does then, light, oh can Streetlight be used for parking data? Streetlight is an is an example of a company that provides you know anonymized um, cell data to address some of these factors. And you know I, I think. Um, 
when I previously worked at Mountain View, I was in collaboration with some Palo Alto folks looking at that. Um, but yeah, that's an, that's one example. Okay. And so just going forwards, as you're looking at data, you'll try different things and see. I mean, it seems like right now we're we're just kind of starting on this uh, license plate readers and seeing how they could be used. Is it they'll just evolve over time, you suspect? I think it'll evolve over time, particularly the data collection piece. Um, you know, the major justification for the LPR has just been the efficiency provided for our um, parking enforcement teams. Um, mm -hmm. So that's been a major um, factor and a major reason we wanted to do that, just to help um, help our programs be a bit more efficient. I mean, right now, we can't chalk cars anymore, can we? Chalk tires. I'm not quite clear if we still if we're still chalking tires. I think PD might still be chalking tires. I thought that um, the LPR good. is only being utilized for our residential programs. Um, so the commercial areas are being still being enforced by um, police department and okay. um, visual over state checks. Oh, okay. So we have so these residential permits they would not be enforced by the police department. No, no, our, our residential programs are enforced by LAS parking. Um, okay. And LAS parking are the vehicle, we have two LAS vehicles that, you know, run the routes and all the RPPs. Um, those are where the devices that the city purchased um, have been installed. Okay, that's interesting. It seems redundant, but uh, it's not good. Uh, anyway, I have some more questions. These are smaller questions, but they just show my ignorance. So. On packet page 11, there's a lot of uh, terminology that I'm not real familiar with. Sure. And one of them is, says, utilize gap management. What is gap management? That is something I actually will have to double check with um, one of our, um, with our consultant to see exactly what they meant. But I believe this is about um, a, a, a technique for establishing the, the data collection. Okay, because it says to monitor officer effectiveness. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but that's fine. Um, then there's another phrase that says, develop a parking ambassador approach to parking. What does that mean? Sure, so there, there's some other examples of some other cities um, that have really kind of taken a customer service approach to their parking programs um, and you know, utilizing parking officers themselves as both kind of educators about our parking rules as well, in addition to just doing the enforcement. Um, so that's something that we would be looking forward to advancing in the future um, once we get a little bit more bandwidth. Um, but we've seen that approach be really useful, um, especially as cities transition toward um, paid parking opportunities. So the parking ambassador is just that the city is, what do they call it, a parking ambassador? There, it's considered a parking ambassador approach because um, you know because it kind of takes a both and or an and plus approach to the enforcement efforts um, and saying you know part of the enforcement effort you know should include education um, but also you know providing um, you know as high a quality of customer service as we can with our parking programs um, and you know putting in potentially diversion programs you know you don't want to just um, you know, we enforce that the rules are followed, um, but we also want to make sure that we're providing, you know, really good customer service and, you know, treating people well. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. You're not the bad guy. You're, we're here to make your parking better. Yeah. There's another phrase, adopt a park once motto for parking management. What does park once mean? So, so as we kind of continue to um, kind of develop what our commercial pilot options could look like, you know, park once is a strategy where you're also thinking about, you know, economic development at the same time. Um, and, you know, we'll have an economic development um, person added soon to the team. Um, I, they will attend many of the same meetings that I, I attend. Um, and so there'll be some opportunity potentially to, you know, strategize about um, using parking permit types to you know, really serve our businesses better than we have been. Okay, this is by clustering them in areas so that if you parked in one area, you could repark or? But, you know, it's kind of a, a suggestion to say, hey, this is where, these are the different ways of getting to Palo Alto for a particular event. You know, these are the locations. We want people to, you know, 
choose the best way to get to town for them. Um, but if they do park, we want to be able to encourage them to come park park once and spend the whole day. You know, maybe use the micro transit shuttle to go somewhere else and come back. Um, but yeah, encouraging them to you know visitors to stay and spend time in Palo Alto is good for our businesses. And um, you know, the park once um, approach really helps um, helps with that. Okay. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Those are helpful. Uh, Nathan, you want to put up your final slide that you wanted some input on? Do you need us to put the slide up? Oh, there it goes. Sorry about that. This took me a minute. Um, you know, you know. Yeah, that's the one. So why don't you speak to the second one there so we understand what that is? We discussed yeah, this so in the pre, in the pre meeting a little bit. There's additional um, part kind of parts of our work program is just continuing to work with city planning um, on the in lieu options that we were developing. Um, and for Cal Ave in particular. Um, so there's additional work that will have to be done. Um, I don't have at the top of my head right now what that all entails, um, but we did present on that at, at city council, um, I think last year. Um, so we'll be needing to continue to revisit that, that item. Um, and then the other thing that we were really hoping to do more in the, the transit shuttle, the micro transit shuttle project might help us kind of start making progress on that. It's just more coordination with the, um, with the TMA um, and with TDM efforts. Um, but parking, you know, parking can be a really key um, component of TDM and TMA collaboration. Um, and so we're, we're, we will definitely be looking forward to that, um, doing more of that in the future. Yeah, items, item two is the one I wanted you to speak to, in-person in -person parking facilities walk. Do you articulate there what you'd like us to do? Sure, so, you know, we, as a means of kind of engaging with our local businesses um, around some of the commercial pilot options that we are thinking about, um, we will be scheduling an in-person walk on, on a, a weekday or a Saturday or so, um, just to look at the parking situation. Um, actually, I'll take some input too on, you know, what day we could use. I, I think maybe the businesses probably would like a, a day that, you know, is typical for them or, you know, suggest something to them that um, could be improved. Um, but yeah, it helps sometimes just to get people together and kind of take a look at things in person to see, um, to just kind of come to, come to solid ground on what needs to happen next. Yeah, but in the pre-meeting, we discussed the fact that uh, that would be open to uh, commissioners uh, to, yes. go on, to go on this walk and see some parking areas that you haven't seen before, parking lots, parking situations. So we'll, we'll leave that in, you, in your court to take the initiative, but I'm sure there'll be commissioners that are interested in that. <clears throat> uh, Vice Chair Suma. Thank you. And yeah, I, I, I would be interested in going on that walk. I always like to look at sites in person. And I was thinking about your um, develop and administer a customer survey. Um, um, I don't think it's needed right now because we still aren't having parking problems really much in the city because of changing parking patterns, which we hope will be temporary to some extent. Mm -hmm. But another really good way to um, get impact from a neighborhood, most neighborhoods have neighborhood associations and to reach out, you know, whatever seems convenient once a year or something and go to one of their meetings so you can, or go on a walk in their neighborhood, you know, um, but that's totally for the future when things are kind of filling up again. I thought I'd just offer that idea. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That's a great suggestion. Okay, I think that does it. Thank you very much. Oh, did you have a comment? Commissioner Heckman, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't see that. Uh, thank you, Chair Lowing. So I just <clears throat> actually wanted to take a moment to appreciate our, uh, our, our planning department, our planning staff. Uh, you know, from time to time, we uh, here at the commission get these program level uh, uh, concepts that are brought to us and, and we're asked to provide our feedback. And, and I thought I heard a lot of good questions from the commissioners, but, but you know, 
in these situations, uh, we're all trying to uh, value add, right? Uh, you know, brainstorm with the staff and help fill in gaps that we see that maybe staff didn't. <clears throat> and so that's the way I, I approach these things. And I approach this one. Um, and then I got to the portion of the staff report that is entitled future policy and action items. And there's two pages of forward thinking here by staff. And as I read through it, I just, you know, my, my kind of my jaw dropped a little bit because it's so comprehensive. Um, and, and I recognize that it at some point started with a blank page. What are we gonna do to move this forward? And these are all the things that staff came up with. Uh, apparently, um, uh, Mr. Baird had mentioned uh, working with a consultant and, and I'm sure other members of the uh, planning staff, but it's, it's really impressive and it left me, in a, a sort of a quandary because I couldn't find any value to add because, because it's so thorough. So, uh, so I thought I would just uh, share that. It's not the only example of, of staff doing a terrific job, but it is uh, the most recent example uh, that I've seen. Uh, and so I wanted to uh, say, you know, this is clearly an important issue uh, for for the city, you've got the commissioners engaged asking, uh, you know, questions to make sure we understand the parameters of it. But this is the kind of forward thinking that that um, we're looking for to to help us uh, shape this to eliminate uh, problems as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you for that, Commissioner Heckman. I think staff certainly thank you and appreciate the comment as well. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beard, and we'll conclude that item. Thank you. The next item is an action item uh, <clears throat> in comparison to a study session on a 2850 West Bayshore Road uh, public hearing quasi judicial um, for uh, applicants re request for a vesting tentative mat for single lot subdivision for condominium purposes of 48 town homes. Great, thank you. We'll have the staff presentation by Mr. Garrett Sauls, and then the applicant will have a presentation afterwards. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, please let me know when you can see my screen. We can see yes. Garrett. Did you want to put it in presentation mode? Yes, I will. Okay, thanks. As Chair Lowing had noted, this is a vesting tenant of map application for 2850 West Bayshore. It is the uh, subdivision application associated with the uh, concurrent architectural review application that is being reviewed, that was reviewed by the Architectural Review Board on April 21st and is pending a review by State Council tentatively on either June 20th or June 21st. So in general, the subdivision application doesn't address or doesn't uh, tend to get towards any of the site design, uh, building design aspects of the development for the site, but it does identify site design characteristics such as private streets or other sort of breakpoints between the units uh, that are identified on the uh, attached plans to the staff report. The site area overall is about 101,000 square feet uh, the proposed floor area, which was a, a, a subnote in the staff report, uh, has been confirmed to be uh, 1.147 uh, to 1 ratio, which is about an 89,608 square foot building. The zone district is an ROLM property that's resident, uh, research office and limited manufacturing. The current existing development on site is an existing office building, uh, which is just uh, which is not a, a historic structure. From a process standpoint, a vesting tenant of MAP intends to subdivide an existing parcel into new parcel or into new parcels or create condominium parcels, which is dependent on the subject, on, subject to the base zoning requirements if someone is trying to subdivide a parcel into smaller parcels. For the city's process, the, the vesting tenant of MAP is required to be reviewed by the Planning and Transportation Commission, who provides a recommendation to City Council. City Council will then review that recommendation from PTC and either approve, conditionally approve, or deny the application. Under the city's current ordinance, 
vesting tentative maps would, techni would technically be required to be filed after all discretionary applications have been approved. The purpose behind this is such is, is in order to vest and pr provide for uh, and lock in per se uh, development standards that were associated with the project that had been submitted through the architectural review process for approval. However, changes to state law have complicated uh, the relationship between the vesting tentative map application and architectural review applications, namely through SB 330 and the Housing Accountability Act, which has limited jurisdictions to five hearings in total, which is inclusive of any subdivision application. In order for us to be able to process this application in conformance with state law, staff elected to, vet, to process the vesting tentative map in the architectural review concurrently. And as I noted before, these applications are intended or scheduled to be heard on June 20th or 21st at the City Council. Related to the project compliance, the site, as I noted before, is a research office and limited manufacturing district. Uh, that zone, the comprehensive plan, land use de designation is a research office park. Uh, as identified in the staff report, the property will conform with the zoning code requirements related to the size of the parcel. Uh, related to the base zoning code, the applicant isn't intending to modify the parcel in any manner other than just to create private streets, uh, as well as then create air parcels to provide for the units to be sold or conveyed separately. The residential office or the research office park designation allows for primarily office research and manufacturing operations. However, it does provide for residential uses through a conditional use permit process, which is also being reviewed through uh, the architecture review application has been and has been directed towards city council in order for that decision to be made on that application. The net density based on the total lot size of the parcel is 30 units per acre based on the, res the research office and limited manufacturing zone district requirements. Uh, whenever a property is developed as a residential component, as a residential project within these zone districts, uh, 30 units per acre or the RM30 standards are the requirements that the project would be held to. The maximum number of units that could be developed on the site is 70. In this table you see here is a, a table from the staff report, which identifies again, the minimum site area required for the zone district, uh, the prop which the property exceeds. It also identifies the minimum site depth and density requirements. Uh, the, prop the property will also be required to provide for up to 15% uh, affordable housing on site and the applicant is, is providing for seven units on site as, and will be paying the fractional 0.2 remainder uh, through in lieu fees. This image is a uh, from the attached plans to the staff report, which identifies again the private streets that the applicant has proposed uh, with their architectural review application. As you can see as well, the parcel boundaries that my mouse cursor is moving along uh, are not affected or not modified as a result of the development on site. This image is again an image from the attached plans, which just shows the layout of what the applicant has proposed in their architecture review application. So each of these individual units would become a condominium or an air parcel, which would be conveyed or sold separately. As a part of the sub under the Subdivision Map Act, the city is required to make reverse findings in order to justify approval for any subdivision application. These findings are identified in the staff report, as well as the attachments in the draft record of land use, which have gone through and identified how the city is able to make these findings specifically on each individual case. Uh, these findings are identified here so that if we need to reference them in the future, they're easy to be able to speak about and share screen and show to the public as well. And staff's recommendation uh, to the Planning Commission would be to recommend approval for the proposed vesting tentative map application to the City Council based on the attached findings and subject to conditions of approval. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Chair, do you want to have the applicant presentation at this time? Yeah, I think that'd be great for all of us to hear first. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, let me make sure I've got this at the right height. Good evening, Chair. 
commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm John Hickey. I'm VP of Development for Summerhill Homes. Uh, before I begin, um, I want to say thank you to Garrett and also to Jody, with whom he's been working uh, on for their uh, review of this project uh, on the city's behalf over the course of the past year almost. I uh, I must say they they put in a lot of hard work and, and we very much appreciate that. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Summerhill Homes, uh, we're part of Summerhill Housing Group, which has been, uh, it's a local company and we've been building communities of distinction for more than 40 years in the Bay Area. Our offices are actually located right here in Palo Alto on California Avenue. Uh, and we've been building homes for Palo Altans since 1993. Uh, we're very excited to have the opportunity to be building a project in Palo Alto again. With me here this evening in person is Elaine Breeze. She's our Senior VP of Development. And we also have available by uh, Zoom our civil engineer if uh, there are technical questions that arise about the map. Uh, as explained in the staff report, uh, Summerhill is proposing to develop 48 townhomes on a 2.3 acre site. Uh, it's uh, near West Bay Shore, on, along West Bay Shore Road and near Greer Park. Um, the hearing tonight, as Greer, uh, Garrett alluded to, is specifically about the proposed tentative map. Uh, so I'd just like to highlight a few points related to the map itself rather than to the larger project. Um, First, as noted in the staff report, the proposed map and the subdivision improvements are fully consistent with the comprehensive plan and with the city code. Uh, and in particular, as Garrett noted, um, the project will comply with the city's affordable housing ordinance and we will pro be providing the seven affordable units on site uh, for moderate income households. Uh, also, I just want to note that the project will comply with the city's energy reach code, and that means that, among other things, uh, the project will um, be all electric. Uh, every building will have a solar energy system, solar panels, and in addition, we'll be providing a uh, wiring for a level two and capacity for a level two electric charger into every garage. Uh, second, as explained in the staff report, the site is very well suited to this type of development and density of development. The site's relatively flat uh, and has access directly to West Bay Shore Road. And that's similar to, for example, the Sterling Park community, which is a little bit south along West Bay Shore, or for example, the Oregon Green Project, which is a little bit north on uh, West Bay Shore Road. Very, very similar types of uh, sites and appropriateness for this type of development. Uh, third, as mentioned in the staff report, the sequel report that was prepared by the city's consultant found that the project would not have any harm on the environment or on public safety. And lastly, the project won't conflict with any public easements that are currently used for uh, access to the site or use of the site. And in fact, what we'll be doing is providing additional easements, which will be providing a public benefit by uh, uh, it's a creative approach that we actually came up with to preserve existing street trees along West Bay Shore Road by extending the the um, the sidewalk in inward, even though it means providing additional public easement on our site. And also what that's giving us an opportunity to do is to both widen the existing northbound bike lane along West Bay Shore, and in addition, provide a new southbound bike lane that will go all the way from our site and past our site down to Colorado um, which uh, will provide access to existing bike routes along there. Uh, for the reasons I've highlighted, uh, we respectfully request your recommendation this evening. Uh, and we thank you for your consideration and are happy to answer any questions. Okay. Let's see. Do we have any public comment on this item? No public if comment. If anybody who is online wants to give public comment, you should raise your. Project team. Yeah. And no one's raising their hand, so thinking they don't want to speak. Okay, let's jump in and just let commissioners address. Um, uh, staff report and or uh, the applicant. So looking for lights or raised hands. Commissioner Heckman. 
Sure, I will uh, lead off. Let me start with a few questions for staff. Uh, I do have a couple of questions for the applicants, but I, I think I'll um, let us cycle through the other commissioners first. So, uh, Mr. Sauls, uh, is this particular location uh, on the housing inventory site list? Um, I can find that answer for you. All right. Um, the next question is, uh, one of your slides and in the staff report, it indicates that the allowable density for this site is in the uh, 37 to 70 range. And uh, the proposal before us is for 48 units. And so my question for staff is whether, is, is there some reason related to our ordinances that, that uh, the applicant was uh, restrained from seeking more than 48 units? Is there, is there some reason in our code that they, you know, they hit the ceiling at 48? Yeah, so I think it's a complex mix of, you know, financial and site design constraints, right? Uh, because technically our code would allow up to 70 units, but related to our floor area ratio, 0.6 uh, to one, that would be, uh, I think if I remember correctly, between five to 600 square foot sized units. Um, and with the type of project that they were proposing, uh, that wouldn't necessarily financially play out. And that's something that's identified also in the, the financial study that we provided uh, that's associated with the architecture review application. But um, that information is on the project web page as well. All right, thank you. Um, I will follow up with the, uh, uh, with the applicant on that. So those are, uh, my questions for staff, come back around to me for some questions to the applicant, Chair. Sure. Other hands, questions? No one? I'll go. I have a question. Uh, okay, Mr. Rectal popped up. Go ahead. Dory has a mission. Go ahead. Oh. Um, I have a question for staff, and that is about the process. Um, I had an opportunity to view the ARB meeting, the last ARB meeting from April 21st, um, and they did not look favorably on the project. So, and because of the state law, um, were, they, they can only be required to have five hearings. So this will be hearing four, and then council will be hearing five. At that same time, will the council do the CUP or is that outside of the five hearing process? So this is hearing three. Oh, this, um, okay. Yes, this is hearing three. Um, and uh, we intend to have hearing four with the vesting tentative map and the architecture review, the concession and the conditional use permit reviewed that same day. So that's why I was saying we had slated uh, either the 20th or the 21st uh, we're uncertain right now as to the date of which one it'll be, but that's mostly just because of, uh, you know, the calendar, council calendar and how full it might get, uh, what items might get pushed off from the 20th to the 21st. But the idea is that we're gonna have both of the, all of these items be held and heard on that same day. In including the CUP. That's correct. And if the council denies it at that time, is, is that, can the applicant change the, I mean, the reason I'm asking this is because the ARB had fundamental issues, right? And so if the council can't um, reconcile those issues, regardless of the decision we recommend tonight, is the applicant, can they come back with a new project or um, that's what I'm, I'm just, the, this process is kind of new to us. Yeah, let's hear council Yang on this, please. Yeah. So. <clears throat> This was uh, ex explained in the staff report, but because this is a housing and development project uh, under the Housing Accountability Act, that state law um, pre prevents the city from denying or reducing the density of this project, unless we can make some very specific and narrow findings uh, that there are adverse impacts that can't be mitigated on public health and safety. Um, so, <clears throat> You know, your question was, 
you know, if the council rejects this project, can the applicant come back? Uh, yes, in theory, but uh, it, you know, state law actually prevents us from rejecting this project. Okay, so, but can, in the CUP process, can the council make conditions that address other aspects of the project that they would like to be different? How broad is that? Yeah, so the city can approve the project with conditions. Um, and as long as those conditions are, you know, specific enough that they can be carried out. So, you know, it couldn't be uh, go back and get the ARB's approval, for example. You know, it has to be definite. Okay. Okay, thank you. And just while we're on that point, I want to comment that, again, we discussed in our planning meeting that uh, this, the, the uh, CUP in this case does not have to come to PTC first. It can go directly to council, which is the plan. So I just want to clarify that. That's right. Uh, typically, a CUP is, gets a decision from the planning director, and then that could be appealed, uh, in which case it would come to the PTC and then to the council. In this case, the director is deferring uh, all these decisions directly to the city council. Um, so it's, it'll be decided by the council in the first instance. Was that all, Vice Chair Suma? Was that all your comments? Was that, yeah. yeah, okay, fine. Um, okay, let's go back to Commissioner Rechtal. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of things I like about this project. I mean, converting office to housing, that's really good because you're taking something that requires housing and you're actually producing housing. So it helps on both ends of the spectrum. Um, and also we're not eliminating, there's no existing housing that gets eliminated, no existing tenants that have to be replaced. So there's a lot of good things about that. And, and also there's no uh, nearby neighbors. And so the neighborhood impacts are much less complicated. So this is a really good site. Uh, this is the kind of project I think we need in Belo Alto. Uh, there is one thing that makes me a bit uncomfortable. Uh, Dory had mentioned the ARB. For ARB, there was a very convincing public letter from Jeff Levinsky talking about why he thought that the uh, the density law, the density bonus qualification was being misused. Did staff, is staff familiar with that letter? It was in the public record. Uh, yes, we we have reviewed that letter. And what's your opinion of his statements? Um, the analysis that we did and the analysis that our economic consultant completed uh, is very typical uh, for this type of request, density bonus request. And um, we think it is well within the, the scope of density bonus law. I mean, he gave some examples of other cities around that apparently are doing their math differently than we are. Uh, so, you know, there are many, many density bonus requests that happen. It, it, I'm sure there are examples of, of how, you know, concessions have been used in different ways, but that's not exhaustive by any means. Okay. And so, so what's the scope of our purview? Suppose we do think that the density bonus law is being misapplied. Uh, is that irrelevant to the decision that we're making tonight? Yes. Okay. And so tonight's vote doesn't set any precedent that that we are endorsing this this application of the density bonus law. We're just saying we are changing the map regardless of density, regardless of development standards. That that's correct. Um, you're you're approving a you know subdivision of the land so that these units can be individually sold. The, the only um, application of density bonus law in this case is FAR, uh, not the number of units, not the number of parcels, condominium you know, parcels that are gonna be created. Uh, so it doesn't really um, factor into the subdivision question that's before the PTC. And I don't know this, if this is a question for staff, or whether this is a question for the applicant is why did they not go the PHC route? This seems to be a, a poster child for a spot that could be used for a PHC. I think that would be something the applicant would have to discuss in terms of yeah, the decision path they've made for their applications. Yeah, I agree. 
Can and the PHC is the uh, planned home zoning, which is a local program here, essentially like a PUD for Palo Alto versus the density bonus application you've submitted. Why don't we pick that up when we go to the applicant? Okay. Did, did you have more, Keith? Uh, yeah, just some questions about the, the sound wall and the uh, bike lane. It says that they're building it in the staff report, but actually are they paying for it and the staff or the city is actually the one who's constructing it and the one who's going to be responsible for maintenance of that? Yeah, so the applicant can speak to that, but my, our understanding is that they will be the ones constructing it and any sort of permits associated with that will be ones that we review and ensure that there's any sort of other, if there's any other sort of compliance questions or, or other sort of requirements related to whether or not they need to get uh, agreement through uh, Caltrans or anything, those are going to be conditions associated with, uh, you know, kind of catch-all conditions associated with the entitlement decision. And that sound wall is that's on Caltrans land or is that on city land? It's on city property. Um, but in the event that there's maybe, you know, some small portions that somehow eek on to Caltrans land, there's just that catch all provision or going to be that catch all provision uh, to be able to anticipate some things that might need to change in the field. Is that common for a private entity to build on city land? Yes, we have um, offsite improvements. Um, they're quite common with subdivision applications okay. that you need to improve yeah, public property as part of that. Okay, and so there's no legal complexity. We do this all the time that we over, they have to give us what they're gonna build and we approve it and then they build it. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you, that's all. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Chang. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to echo Commissioner Rechdahl's comments about how this is uh, the, the kind of project that we really want to see converting office to housing. I did have a bunch of questions, some of just for my education. Um, so the first one is regarding the affordable or the below market rate units. Um, does BMR mean for moderate mean uh, for 80 to 120% of AMI. Is that my correct understanding from me? That's correct. Okay, thanks. Um, and then how does this work in terms of specifying that seven units are going to be BMR? Are those, does that come later on or do we know which seven units? How does that work in this whole project? This is kind of for my education. Uh, so we will, enter into a, a regulatory agreement with the developer that will specify which units uh, in the development will be the BMR units. And we, you know, go through a process, our, our housing planner will take a look at unit sizes and locations and make sure that they're representative of the development as a whole and they're, they're you know, spread out throughout the site. Okay, because that was kind of where I was trying, what I was trying to understand is, you know, if, some, if seven of them are BMR and the size of the units ranges from 1,600 to 2,100, it would be some distribution of that. It wouldn't be all the BMR units would be 1,600 square feet, for example. That's right. We, we make sure that it, it's, uh, you know, a representative sample. Okay, great. Um, and then I had a question. You can tell me if this is out of scope. Um, so it's great, first of all, that the that the uh, current plan has parking for each unit um, because there really isn't much transportation in that area. Um, but when I went to visit the site this weekend, just to familiarize myself with what I was looking at on the plans, I noticed that for the development to the north, that the um, parking along the street for that development was just packed, right? And so I'm wondering how is visitor parking going to be handled in this situation? Because I was looking at the private streets and there isn't any place for people to park. Um, and so, and, and uh, Bayshore is a busy road. So I'm just wondering what the, what the thinking was there because I, I did see that there were four visitor spots, but I could also see how those would be occupied. And then 
Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what the thought was on where people would park. Yeah. So there are those four visitor parking spaces that are provided there. Currently on Bayshore, as you noted, there are the street parking spaces. Those street parking spaces in front of this property would be uh, eliminated in order to provide for that bike lane. Right. Um, and so our code currently requires that each unit, if it has a two bedroom uh, unit or greater, has to provide for two parking spaces, um, which the applicant is providing for. Uh, we don't have a requirement for guest parking spaces anymore. Okay, I'm just trying to envision the future, you know, pedestrian safety, that kind of a thing, and just making sure, I, ho hoping that, you know, we're looking at how the sidewalk connects, because I think they're going to have to walk quite far um, based on where parking is allowed. I, I could be wrong, though. So I just wanted to flag that as something to think about for the future. I, I understand that it's not um, required for this project, but I also want to make sure that people stay safe. Um, and then, oh, this is a question. Does this count towards the current arena or the future arena that we've seen in the housing element that's currently being planned for? Um, so I can answer that Rachel, here if you'd like to. Sure. Um, so part of what would happen is it the arena um, allocation in terms of uh, when we get to count it is when the building permits are issued. And so part of that depends on when they get to that stage of the permit, the building permit issuance. Does that answer your question? Okay, so when does the current arena end then? So 2023. Um, so it just depends on the speed of, I mean, we're halfway through 2022, if we can believe it or not. Um, and so it depends on if they are approved at council and then um, getting all of the more refined drawings needed to submit for building permit and then getting those approved as well. So um, if that happened before the end of this year, I believe it would count for this year's arena cycle. If it happened into next year, that'd be for the next uh, cycle. Okay. Um, and again, tell me if this is off topic because it sounds like it's not relevant to the approval of the parcel map, but I um, was looking at the calculation of the FAR and I'm curious and would like to understand how that works in terms of the concession, in, in terms of concessions and how, what the process is for how that all works. In so terms of, was, did you want to go into that, Garrett? I know that was sure. yeah, researched that was quite a bit. That was discussed in the ARB staff report. So oh, that would okay. be a good tool for you to reference on that. But in general, floor area on multi or on commercial and multifamily properties are measured to the exterior of the, mo the most exterior point of the material of a building. Um, and as it relates to the concession, uh, this property had requested additional floor area, which there's not necessarily a, uh, there's an on menu and an off menu opportunity for individuals to apply for. Uh, concession. On menu options are ones that uh, applicants don't need to identify additional pre additional documentation to describe how those findings are being met. Uh, the city, if, if those criteria are met uh, based on the on menu options in, 18, in our Palo Alto Municipal Code, uh, Chapter 18.15, then the city, you know, to my understanding, mostly grants those without any sort of, not, I wouldn't say, you know, without looking at it again, but obviously, uh, you know, that's an understood and kind of pre-approved concession to provide. Off-menu concessions require additional documentation to demonstrate that the concession that's being provided is uh, supporting or, or providing for the creation of affordable housing. Okay, and then so, because it says that this concession was made um, through state density bonus law, so State density bonus law must allow a certain amount. Is this right up to the amount? Is it over the amount? Is it, but uh, right. Yeah. So the, the state law requires a varying amount of affordability and provides also for a varying amount of concessions based on the level of affordability. Uh, the minimum amount, if I remember correctly, Mr. Yang can correct me, is is ten percent. Our municipal code requires fifteen percent at a, at a minimum. And so the applicant kind of by proxy, by meeting our own local standards mm -hmm. for affordability, they already qualify for one concession uh, based on a moderate income level. If they were to go with a deeper level of concession, like a low or a very low income level, they might be able to provide for, uh, receive two concessions from the city or up to three, if I remember correctly. Okay, thank you.
And I was able to confirm for uh, Commissioner Heckman, uh, the site is not on a on the housing inventory site for the housing housing inventory list. Thank you, Vice Chair Shula. Thank you, and um, I also want to thank the applicant for this. is is the kind of project we need um, converting uh, commercial to housing. So thank you for that. I did have a couple questions about a couple of the findings. And um, the first one is the finding about, it's finding number um, F46 on packet page 38. And I understand that there are guidelines about uh, residential buildings that are close to freeways in the state of California, and that this is exempt under um, CEQA under exemption number, class 32 exemption from CEQA. Could you explain that a little bit? Because I couldn't really find out what that was. Right, so a class 32 exemption discusses infill development on a site. So when a site is currently developed, uh, you know, kind of in a, a lowest threshold standard, you can imagine a parking lot, uh, you know, just being part of a development uh, or a, a site being developed. And then in a greater sense, you can think of what's existing on this parcel already, you know, commercial or, you know, some building that's on the site already. Uh, and when it comes to redisturbing either the land or redeveloping the site, there are certain criteria that identify whether utilizing or, or redeveloping the site constitutes additional impacts uh, onto the environment. Um, so that also, that environmental document is also on the city's webpage uh, for the project and identifies that the project was able to meet all the exemptions to the exception for a class 32 infill development. Okay, so this does not refer to um, health hazards from uh, the freeway exhaust. No, uh, I mean, those are, go ahead. So uh, CEQA is not concerned with impacts of the environment on future residents. It's, it's just about impacts of the development on the environment. Okay, so am I wrong in thinking there are state guidelines that kind of say, kind of limit the time you should be outside for residential, um, you know, projects that are close to freeways within a certain distance? Uh, I do not oh. know the answer to that. Okay, but anyway, this um, finding does not have to do with that at all. Uh, it it could, uh, but we don't have. I, I don't have the information about what those standards might be if they exist. Okay, thanks. And then, um, with regards to the project is consistent with the comp plan policies. Um, I just have a couple questions I'd like to put in the record about that. And I think it, my observation of the site plan on, um, well, it could be C2, but it's really the private streets. Um, uh, and this kind of dovetails with Commissioner Chang's comments, but um, I do see the site as being somewhat constrained in terms of um, um, parking options if somebody was having deliveries, uh, the garbage pickup, I don't, and I do, I think this is in our purview. I think this has to do with site circulation. If I'm wrong, you'll let me know. But I do see the site as being constrained in what it can offer for the, for loading and pickups and deliveries. And possibly if you're having a larger event, you know, and the parking is all taken, where people would park if the uh, four, I think it was, visitor parkings that were provided were not um, available. And thank you for providing for, because that was more than the code asked for. And then at the same time, while I find that the streets take up a lot of the project, and I think, I, I don't find them pedestrian and bike friendly. Um, so that's, and we have a big emphasis in our code and um, the comp plan um, policies provided on packet page 36 mentioned this in two or more of them. So I just think if there's a way to think about that without 
redesigning the whole project, which I know the applicant does not want to do. And this was um, supported by the ARB, um, the final ARB review. And um, I, I think that's sort of a lost opportunity. I, I just wanted to say that. And it's kind of hard. I, I feel we're very constrained because it, for one hand, we love getting all this housing and we appreciate the applicant for going that direction. On the other hand, the ARB was um, unanimous in feeling it was not adequate in this way. So um, I just wanted to get that on the record and see if, I, I think that some changes are planning to be made by the applicant potentially um, before it goes to council. I don't know if that's true. That's of course up to the applicant, but I just wanted to acknowledge that in that regard, it could have been um, designed differently. If I may, Chair or uh, Vice Chair, uh, if you'd like to have the applicant answer the question regarding circulation and if they plan to make any improvements or what those are, that would be the most appropriate person to respond to any future changes. Or if the commission has any specific items that you think would make it more bike friendly or slow traffic, you know, there are different treatments and interventions that could occur in the roadway to um, moderate any concerns that. Uh, could help pedestrians and cyclists. Did you want the applicant to share any future plans? Yeah, it, uh, but if you're almost done, we can hold that and then we can just go because I know Commissioner Heckman has some for the applicant as well. Um, Not that you have to be. I, uh, one sorry. last tiny mm -hmm. question about the sidewalk. Is this, What's the sidewalk width? Is it gonna, I, I was a little confused about that. It's not going to be a three-foot sidewalk. It's just going to be three-foot easement. Okay, we can ask that of the applicant okay. as well. Just a second. So, so Thank you very much. So let's 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 move to that. But I do want to also, for the record, just do the since it's quasi judicial, we should do uh, uh, any disclosures. And so we can take this uh, pause here between uh, questions and going to the uh, applicant to see if there's any disclosures. So I'll just start on my left uh, with uh, Commissioner Heckman. None. Uh, Commissioner Chang. No. And Vice Chair Suma. No. Uh, Commissioner. Rectal? None. Commissioner Rupavar? Um, I don't think I have any disclosures, but I spoke with uh, Mr. Yang about this. I do live in a Summerhill Homes property in the nearby area. In the what? In that area? In, you in, said? in, in like not within 500 feet, but in that area. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I have no disclosures as well. Let's go to questions to the applicant then, and we can light up for that. I know you, you've been waiting, uh, Commissioner Heckman. Yeah, please uh, take the mic. I'd be happy to. Would you like? How would uh, would you like? To I'll just call the commissioners. Or, okay. I'll just call commissioners. Yeah. Commissioner Heckman, start off. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions, Mr. Hickey. Um, the, the 48 units, mm -hmm. which are uh, proposed or, or really relevant to us, the, the 48 condominium lots, because uh, mm -hmm. we're here to talk about a map. Um, I, I was just curious, why, why did that turn out to be the sweet spot for Summerhill? Um, you know, we're, we're interested in housing, we're interested in more housing. There is at least a theoretical possibility to go to 70. You chose 48, and I was wanting a little better understanding of why that, that works best for summer. Right. And, and I guess simply put, the type of product that we're building, this, this townhome product, which is a three-story product with an attached garage, um, you really can't have any more units than that with that product type. That's the absolute maximum because you have a minimum footprint that you need for that garage and for the space to get upstairs. Uh, so beyond that, we simply, we couldn't get, we would have liked to have developed more than 48 at the town, but that simply wasn't an option uh, in part due to actually the city's requirements about street widths, uh, which I can get into in a moment. And, uh, you know, whenever we're looking at a project, we're looking at, you know, what are, what are various other different types of product that we could look at on a, on a site. And in this particular case, it, it wouldn't be feasible to do something that's a much higher density. Like, a, you know, people sometimes think of perhaps like a five, six story condominium building or something like a, a, a true stacked flat type of condominium building in part because of the location we are in the height of the flood plain. So we can't have the subgrade parking in, a, in the flood zone. Unfortunately, it wasn't an option. All right. 
Right. And then uh, the other question I had for you is I drove by the site a few days ago and there's a for lease sign mm -hmm. uh, in front of the property. And I was wondering what was that about? Is Summerhill keeping its options open? Um, so we don't, we're actually have the project, the property in contract, but we don't actually own the property. We haven't closed escrow on the property yet. So the, the current property owner, that's, that's a question for them. They, it, it, typically we find that property owners until we've closed escrow on a property usually keep their options open. All right, thank you. Vice Chair Zuma. Thank you. And um, I appreciate um, the question about maximum units, but I also appreciate that this will be family housing, mm -hmm. which is something we really need in Palo Alto too. So um, my question to you was just after the, at the ARB suggestion, it, I don't know if you were able to make any changes uh, and at all. And if, and it's, what I'm most concerned about, I think, is really how bike and pedestrian friendly this project is. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate the question. I think that um, this is a product type that, although we um, have built it in a number of other cities in the peninsula nearby um, and in the South Bay, and we know it's very popular with buyers, um, it's not one that's typical in Palo Alto. And I think that may be causing a certain level of confusion about how this product lives. It's important, and, you, and this is not, granted, this is not part of your purview, so you may not have looked at this, but I, I think it's important to understand that the way these homes are oriented, the front entry, the, the outward facing public face of each one of these units is not on the same side as the garage. So they're really designed to be a, you walk up to the front door, the front doors of buildings, for example, buildings one, two, and three face towards West Bayshore, the front entries, the, the front doors face towards um, West Bayshore, the garages don't, you don't see garages, they're back behind and they're back behind by intent so that there's not a garage focused type of development. Similarly for buildings four and eight, which are the two that one that faces towards the north and one that faces towards the south, the front entries, the, the front doors face outward and the, the private streets, although we're calling them streets because that's the way the, the term that the city uses, they're really not intended to be a primary walking route. The primary walking route is an established walkway. We have, if you look at the site, we've got walkways all over the site for pedestrians, um, you know, and they lead to the front door because the front door is where you will walk into your home. They lead into the common area. They lead actually one of the changes that we made at the ARB's request at our hearing in January was to, um, to create a uh, pedestrian, direct pedestrian connection at the rear of the site to the park. Um, it's a challenge because of the flood zone constraints and the fact that we need to lift the site out of the flood zone, but we were able to do it yeah. in part by changing the design of building seven and eight, which actually made them a, a little bit smaller. Um, but what that does is, um, it, again, it's just more circulation around the site. And I actually want to mention that for a moment because um, the one of the big advantages of it is it gives a direct connection to all of the on-street parking along Colorado Avenue, which granted is, is on-street parking, it's, it's not off-street parking, but I, I actually live very close to the site and I can tell you from personal experience, walking my dog because she's spoiled far more frequently than she probably deserves to be, um, that there's always a lot of open parking along there. Now, you know, if somebody has a, a huge raging party, you know, where they're inviting 80 guests. Yes. I mean, that's going to be a problem anywhere. Right. But that's going to be a problem for all the neighbors too. So, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, but in terms of, um, in terms of a safe route to that parking, it's actually that, that route through the park is actually lit at night. And there's even an emergency phone along there, one of those blue light emergency phones. So um, I, I think the, the bottom line is that we, we have tried to design the streets, um, design the, the, the circulation around the site. So it's really focused on pedestrians and getting to the front door. It's not about having a shared vehicle and, and pedestrian route. We've really tried to separate them. Now, along B Street, we actually, because the street's wide enough there, we were actually able to create a sidewalk for an additional circulation route, but that's actually duplicative to one that's just on the other side of, of building six anyway. Uh, so I appreciate the question. Um, and I, and I um, we definitely agree that, it, that 
the pedestrian circulation is a very important part of it, but I think it's an, also important to understand how these, these um, homes live and the fact that it's different perhaps than what we used to in Palo Alto. Yeah, and I'm also thinking that when you build this housing type, often there's side streets associated. I mean, this is different because you're only uh, fronting one street, which makes it feel a little enclosed. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. And if I don't know if you'll be able to, res you know, make any changes before it goes to the council, because I'm sure, you know, that would be appreciated. Yes. So thank, thank you so much. That. Thank you. Commissioner Rupavar. Thank you. Um, just a few comments and then some questions for the applicant, but I'm actually very excited to, to see this project. Um, one, it's gonna bring much needed housing that we need. We've talked about housing on Fabian Way up Bay Shore. So I do know that that's a priority for us. I also do wanna point out like myself having a young family and how expensive Palo Alto is. Um, these types of townhome communities are very much starter homes for people that otherwise can't afford the five to $6 million homes that on average uh, cost in Palo Alto um, to be able to live here. So like I said, I live in a, and I'm not like advocating for Summerhill or anything like that, um, but I live in one of these communities and it allowed us the opportunity to be able to move and take advantage of uh, the schools and be able to, you know, raise a family here. All of my neighbors have young kids like I do um, and are in the same position as I am. So with that, my question uh, for you is what you're describing seems to be like the community that I live in, the Echelon community, which was built by Summerhill Homes, where it's the uh, condominiums. I think we have about 48 parking on the bottom streets with that face the um, like the front of the homes with the garages in the back. And if that is accurate, um, you tell me, but I was gonna suggest if my fellow commissioners wanna get a sense of what this might look like, maybe they could venture into my community and, and I'm happy to show you guys around myself as well. So is that accurate or no? It was built in 2008. I, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with it. I'm not intimately familiar with it, but I believe that actually Elaine, well, I don't know if intimate is the right word, but if, and, <laughs> Elaine is very familiar with the project. So I'll let her speak to that. It, it has been a few years. <laughs> Thank you, um, Elaine Breeze with Summerhill. Um, yes, that's generally the same idea. Um, I, I don't remember exactly all the site layout, but the concept is similar um, as what's been described here. Um, and I will say the one, because in, in re re remembering the site, uh, it, 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 there's elements that face a public street. I would say what's actually really great about this Greer site, uh, being at Greer Park is are the, the front doors that um, John was describing actually face out to the park, which is fantastic. And it's part of like the eyes on the street. And so that, that's just a really unique benefit for our homeowners as well as I think the park. So thank you. And then the proximity, I think, to the Baylands is, you know, helpful for the families in the community. So I did want to point that out, especially with the new pedestrian bridge that was built. I, I um, was just one, about to mention that, yes. Yeah. Um, one more kind of suggestion related to the parking uh, issue that my fellow commissioners raised. But our community, we have, like, along the streets, additional parking. So we are never parking constrained. Like, I think on your map, it would be like on B street, there's there's just parking there. Is that something that's possible to do here? Do you know what I'm saying? Like the parallel parking on all the it, way up and down, we have like a ton of visitor parking. Yeah, I appreciate the question. And, and um, we have, we worked really hard to see if we could find room for any additional parking there. What you might notice is that in, in addition to the four full-size parking spaces that we have, we've created a, a fifth, what we call sort of a, a, an, an Uber or a DoorDash um, spot, which is not large enough to be something that people would want to really park in, but it's it's recognizing that there are going to be a lot of deliveries. Now, one of the things that you probably recall too is that um, the city now requires that the streets be 32 feet wide in developments like this. And so, um, you know, it, it, 
the reality is that that's enough room if somebody is turning on their hazard lights and running in with a delivery to park there for three minutes without blocking traffic getting in and out um you know that's it, it's the reality of of what happens we know i, I as i say i live just down the street at the parker palo alto and uh, you know there are people with their blinkers on delivering doordash all the time in the public street <laughs> thank you um those are all my questions sorry go ahead chair long go ahead if you have more questions? No, I didn't have any more questions. I just had one final comment that I want to make is that, you know, as one of the, the neighbors of uh, this site, I would, I'm actually very excited to see it convert to residential because when I do walk up and down Bayshore or Fabian with my daughter, it feels very cold and industrial. Um, and I do want to have more of a community uh, feel and it, it to feel safer, frankly, because it's dead at night and on weekends otherwise. Thank you. There you go, neighbor comment for no extra charge. <laughs> <laughs> We're providing our own public comment tonight, thanks to uh, Commissioner Rupavar. Um, I, I just wanted to add that uh, I, I, echoing, I guess, primarily what uh, Commissioner Rechtal said, and uh, he and I are both on the housing element working group and working hard uh, as uh, this commission will do in the next month or so uh, to try to figure out, you know, where to put houses and what kind and so on. And um, I, I just couldn't be more delighted with the concept of removing office and putting housing in there because that solves a double whammy for us as a city because our ratio is out of whack and that helps with that a lot. Um, secondarily, frankly, more importantly, is that uh, while I appreciate that uh, maybe you would have preferred 70 because of the economics, uh, you're, you're getting a lot of money for these houses, no problem. Uh, but it's so beneficial to the city to be addressing this segment of families, uh, as Commissioner Rupar actually commented. And that's one of the things that we've been very concerned, a couple of us on, on that housing element, that we're not going to be able to provide for that because we need exactly this kind of product. So uh, a salute to you for helping us uh, with that. Uh, we need a lot more, but 48 is a really good start. Thank you. Uh, so I really, uh, it's, it's really important in terms of the values of being able to have people that can come here and have their first kid and then have another kid and stay here as opposed to come here for temporary housing, as I call it. Uh, and then they have to move somewhere else mm -hmm. because there's just not anywhere that they can, they can go uh, economically that's going to fit with a, a uh, even not economically, but uh, <clears throat> if they have, you know, two great jobs and they, they can afford it, that's a little bit better. But uh, this is just this is just a great product. I mean, the fact that it's by parks and open space, which is another thing on the housing element we keep talking about. You can't just be putting up units all over the place. You have to put it up where there's some open space where people aren't crowded, where they can get out into nature. So obviously it's a it's a particular asset of, of that site that is going to be phenomenal for the for the residents quick access to 101. Um, I do think uh, uh, to Vice Chair Suma's uh, comments that the biggest problem uh, of pedestrian and bikes has been addressed, which is doing something on that uh, on the Bayshore there to really help make that you know more safe for folks that are moving along there because that's not only industrial as Commissioner Rupavar said and not beautiful, but uh, you can get some zoom, zoom, zoom uh, from, from the cars there. <clears throat> Uh, and then, of course, I know it's by code, but the fact that we're not having to argue about parking concessions with uh, homes that we know are going to have two cars, uh, I think, is, is is a real good asset as well. <clears throat> Go ahead. I, I, I recall there was a question about the width of the sidewalks, too. Uh, okay, I sure. wasn't sure whether that was still uh, to be answered. Feel so free I to just wanted to, to explain, and you may have seen this, uh, although it probably wasn't entirely clear on the map. Um, that you were looking at. So what we currently there's an attached sidewalk, a, a monolithic sidewalk that runs right against the, the street. What we're doing is we're actually pulling it back inward on the inward side of the street tree so that we can save the street trees. Um, and what that's doing is not only creating a nice wide landscape strip, which is exactly what you're talking about, is that buffer between anybody driving quickly down the street and, and the feeling of being a safe pedestrian walking along there. But uh, I think our public sidewalks, and uh, I believe it's five feet wide for the public, yes, five feet wide for the public sidewalks. Um, and then, uh, but it only required three feet of additional easement to provide that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Chang. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for a lot of the things that you're doing in this project, the large units, 
the, the easement to save the trees, the wider sidewalk, those all look fantastic. And I was really glad to hear about the you know, kind of pseudo drop off zones because that seems like a really important thing to have as well. I had a, a, a question out of curiosity for you because I was looking at some of these um, elevations and mm. you've mentioned several times the floodplain. Mm. So I looked at the elevations and in some of the elevations, it looks like the housing starts almost at somebody's head or even above that. Can you explain just what's going on there? Because I was also looking at the elevation for A, I think, Private Street A, and it looks like that street's kind of like down low relative to the housing, if I'm... Uh, I don't remember that specifically, but I can explain the, the underlying situation, which is that the site, the elevation of the site currently is somewhere in the seven to seven and a half foot above sea level range, uh, which is typical for along there. In fact, you know, the park behind is even lower. Mm -hmm. um, but the... Um, we're building it to meet the flood, the proposed flood zone, uh, base flood elevation of 12 feet. So, um, because that's that's what's anticipated to be the the flood level in a, a event of a 100 year storm event, um, and the building code requires that we have our finished floors be at least one foot above that um, that base flood elevation, uh, and that the pads need to be at the base flood elevation at a minimum. So that's why we've needed to increase the the height of the site, but we're trying to do it in such a way that it's minimizing the the impact and visibility of it from the uh, perimeter, which is which you, you may not have seen this again in the plans because it's it's really more related to the to the CUP and the architecture for review, but we've actually tiered our retaining walls so that there's a landscape terrace between the two tiers, which will allow us to screen the upper retaining wall. In addition, it allows us to have vines go over the, the lower retaining wall to really try to, um, to minimize the visibility of it. And actually come to think of it, speaking of walls, yes, the, the sound wall we will be building ourselves at our own cost. Um, and that sound wall, it's actually quite similar to what you see farther down West Bay Shore at the Sterling Court project um, down by Carmel Stone Imports, a little bit south of that, um, where it's it's actually on city property. So there's an encroachment permit that's granted by the city for it. Um, but our, our intention is not to have any of it encroach into the Caltrans right of way. And there are, you know, we, we're going to have vines growing up the, the, the wall, uh, which is similar to what's on the the Caltrans sound wall farther up West Bay Shore by Amarillo. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, I did see the retaining walls and I was thinking about sort of the overall height and what was going on there. So thank you for answering that question. Really appreciate it, makes sense. And yeah, the treatment seems to be much better than just going straight up uh, from, uh, you know, looking at it from the park. So thank you. Commissioner Rectal. Yeah, I had one question about the PHC. I mean, you did a lot of density bonus gymnastics to boost the FAR. I'm curious why this project just didn't go directly to PHC, the planned home zoning. Uh, I guess the simple answer is because the state density bonus law was available and that was a more efficient um, approach to the entitlements for the project. And if you had the ability to further increase your FAR, would you be able to add bedrooms to the designs or are you maximum? Well, it's, it comes down to balancing um, space in the interior of the units with um, a, a design that's pleasant for the community and for the public at large um, that tries to minimize the, the massing of the, of the project from the exterior. So that actually has been a large part of, of um, the back and forth that we had, first of all, with staff, and then some of the discussions with the ARB. Part of the reason that we changed buildings four, five, seven, and eight is to to pull them farther back from from the rear property line, so that they they would be there would be a little bit more room for some uh, um, some trees in there, and also just give them a little more space from from the park. Okay, so you think you're at the sweet spot for FAR right now? Yes, I would say so. Um, it's, it's, it's Palo Alto, as you know, has a slightly different way of calculating FAR for residential than most other cities do because it's based on net rather than gross. Um, but this um, FAR, but it also excludes garages to the extent that the garage is less than 230 feet, square feet per 
um, garage space. Um, but uh, it's a, comparable to what the FAR that we've had uh, using a similar type of townhome development in, in other cities, very, very much in that, in that zone. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there aren't any other comments, um, are we ready for uh, any kind of motion, which is relative in our purview, relative to page uh, mostly 17 and 18 in the findings? Uh, Commissioner Heckman, I think the light was on first. Yeah, thank you. Um, I haven't actually made any comments yet. I just that I was going through rounds of questions okay. first with staff and then with the applicant. But uh, thank you, Mr. Hickey. I think I think we're yep. done with the questions of, of uh, the ahead. applicant. So uh, a couple of uh, uh, questions. Probably these are going to mm -hmm. be directed toward Mr. Yang because they have to do with uh, the uh, the language of a couple of the proposed conditions of approval. Uh, and the first one, and again, these are small nits, but I just want to uh, bring them out so we get our language precise. Uh, planning division condition number three, uh, the first sentence ends with... Um, so what page are you on? Oh, I'm sorry, packet page 39. And the number three, the preamble to the ABC, et cetera, talks about uh, before issuance of the parcel map. So I think that may be carryover language from um, you know another time where this was used with the parcel map, the the you know the VTM vesting tenant map, a slightly different creature. And so I thought maybe we could just drop out the word parcel there. It's more accurate for this particular set of conditions. Sure. Thank you. And then on packet page 41, uh, which is condition four of the planning division conditions uh, that makes uh, it's the final map expiration, which provides for one year uh, expiration. You have basically one year after the VTM approval um, to record your final map or it expires. Um, uh, there are uh, extensions available to uh, the vesting tentative map. And in fact, I, I don't know if it's more the the rule than the exception that that uh, those exception the, those extensions are necessary, and so again to sort of set expectations in the community when they read conditions like this, I was wondering if uh, it would be useful to add af at the end of the sentence uh, at the end of the paragraph, comma absent extension, since it's very commonplace to seek these extensions. Yes, <clears throat> and. Uh... I, I'm seeing, I think that 12 months is, is outdated as well. So we'll, we'll double check that, that length. All right. Uh, so those were my only, those were my last two questions on those two uh, uh, minor issues. I, I do want to say that, that uh, uh, I think it's a terrific project. I appreciate uh, Summerhill for conceiving it, for bringing it to us. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to receive a housing proposal that uh, uh, doesn't have uh, opposition from the surrounding neighbors and all you had to do was find a site that didn't have any surrounding residential neighbors to deliver that. So I'm appreciative of that. Uh, and, and you've heard from, you know, uh, virtually all of the uh, commissioners that, that you know, this is a, for us a step in the right direction. And, and uh, you brought it to us. And so I'm appreciative of that. Uh, I do want to say that, that uh, I'm, uh, uh, well, first of all, that, that we do have there's a very limited focus to what we're being asked to do tonight, and that is uh, approve the subdivision map, and the findings have to do with the design of the subdivision. And this is a little confusing sometimes because the word design makes you want to think about what's being built there. But, but in our context tonight, the only thing that we're concerned about that's being built are basically roads, roads and sidewalks. And are they the right width and, and, and the lines between the units that are being proposed, um, uh, do those fall within our uh, codes and state law? And so we're, uh, you know, technically the concept of FAR um, is talking about how much you can put on any one of those lots or really all of them. And so that's, that's uh, uh, beyond our purview. I think it helps round out our understanding, and I think the way you know the way Palo Alto does its planning process with a separate ARB and um, uh, uh, PTC kind of uh, 
fractures what in other communities is, is kind of a, a, a whole animal that gets looked at. So I do think that that is uh, important to have that background in the dialogue. But, but when we come now to a motion of vote, I think we have to focus in that we're talking about the design of the, the subdivision improvements. And, and as near as I can uh, see from the staff report, it makes clear uh, they're, they're compliant with all of our requirements. And so um, I'm, I'm going to be a supportive of a motion to approve. Um, I think that the findings are adequate and supported by uh, uh, substantial evidence. And of course, that would be a motion to recommend to the city council uh, that they approve. Thank you. Commissioner Chang. So was that an actual motion or should I make a motion? So are we Go trying ahead. to do comments? I uh, mean, I think we all yeah. kind of made comments. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I didn't want to jump the gun on uh, right. any further I can, comments. I'm happy to make a motion to, um, to so I would move the staff recommendation, which is to recommend approval of the proposed vesting tentative map to the city council based on findings and subject and subject to conditions of approval uh, with, the change, with the language changes to the draft record that were suggested by Commissioner Heckman. That's my motion. Happy to second it. Is there any other discussion on, on the motion? Okay, let's go for a roll call vote. Thank you. Commissioner Cheng? Yes. Commissioner Hackman? Yes. Chair Lawing? Yes. Commissioner Regdal? Yes. Commissioner Rupervar? Yes. Vice Chair Suma? Yes. Commissioner Templeton? Uh, absent. Motion, car motion carries six zero. Okay, uh, thanks to the applicant for uh, for the work and the presentation and answering the questions, and to staff uh, who uh, some of whom are in absentia tonight and, and that you acknowledged uh, to to get to this stage. And uh, I think be best of luck as you go to council on this. This is exactly the kind of project we need. Thank you. Okay. We'll move to next item. Can't get back to it that fast. Page 47. 47. You're adding value all the time here. <laughs> I mark everything. Yeah. I knew we had minutes, I just didn't know which date. So, so we do have to approve uh, minutes, uh, draft summary minutes of March 30, 22. Ooh. And these, I believe, um, we need to have some corrections already, correct? Yeah. And then yep. we, we got the corrected minutes for our review. Yeah, correct. I have received corrections from Commissioner Chang and Commissioner Hackman. Right. Okay. Do we have a motion to uh, approve those? Commissioner Hackman moves, and we need a second from somebody. Vice Chair Suma is going to second. I can feel it. <laughs> no. All right. Second from Commissioner, Commissioner Chang on the 30th. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Chang? Yes. Commissioner Hackman? Yes. Chair Lowing? Yes. Commissioner Regdal? Yes. Commissioner Ruparvar? Yes. Vice Chair Suma? Abstain. Motion carries 5 0. Our next set of minutes is uh, April 20th draft summary minutes, also inclusive of any changes. Motion on that. So moved. Okay. Second. Moved and seconded. So this is April 20th draft summary meeting minutes. I don't recall if anyone was absent or not, but you do. No, okay, go ahead. Commissioner Chang. Yes. Commissioner Hackman? Yes. Chair Lowing? Yes. Commissioner Regdal? Yes. Commissioner Ruparvar? Abstain. Vice Chair Suma? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. All right. And uh, lastly is uh, April 27th draft verbatim minutes. Looking for a motion on those. Commissioner Heckman, moves? Move approval of those minutes as revised. 
I'll second for convenience and go to roll call vote, please. Commissioner Heckman? Yes. Commissioner Chang? Yes. Chair Lowey? Yes. Commissioner Regdal? Yes. Commissioner Ruparvar? Same. Vice Chair Suma? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Okay, thanks very much. That gets rid of all of those for tonight. Uh, and then we move to committee items. And we have at least one committee active, which is the uh, ad hoc committee of the PTC on the upcoming housing. So if there are all or some uh, of the members of that committee would like to give a report, uh, that would be great. Just check in with us on what's happening. I can give my status that this is just a introductory. We thought it would be, <laughs> Jonathan thought it'd be like a half hour and we ended up taking the full time. Uh, just an overview of the process and what we're going to be doing. And so I thought it was very good. Uh, maybe Commissioner Chain can give her perspective since she's the yeah. newer on that. But we will be meeting every Friday now for the next few weeks. So it's, it's significant, but I think we're making progress. Yeah, so we just did an overview and I think what we're waiting on the next step is a little bit more detail. Um, staff is fleshing out some of the programs um, and then they'll send that to us so that we have a little bit more to discuss. Uh, so we're picking up right picking up after what the last two housing element uh, working group meetings did. So yeah. we did that homework and read that. And then the programs are kind of, we're kind of in that state and staff just need a little bit more time to flesh out the programs before we could have a more robust discussion in the um, ad hoc. So we really didn't discuss anything other than process thus far. Yeah. You got the, 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 the baton, the precise baton that was handed from the housing element to, to you guys. Uh, and now you're saying that staff's going to put a little bit more meat on those bones for your next meeting uh, this tomorrow, I guess, this coming Friday. Thursday, Thursday is tomorrow, Friday. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, I don't think we have any other committee to report. So any commissioner questions, comments, announcements, and then we'll take a look, quick look at future agenda items if there are no announcements or... Okay, so future agenda items we already know uh, we're set up for two meetings of looking at the housing element and ADUs is referenced in there, but per the meeting we discussed yesterday, that's not going to come to us in that second June meeting. Yeah, that would be for July. That'll be fur further out. Mm -hmm. And just want to thank the, the committee for meeting so frequently and helping us get the housing element done. So I know that's more service time, but we, we do appreciate your support. And then um, as commissioners are planning holiday getaway vacations, just please let Medina know if you have a commission date that you're gonna be missing just so we can keep tracking um, quorum on uh, the dates that we have scheduled. But other than that, I think I went over the future council agenda items earlier and June will be housing element and housing element. So yeah. hopefully you're looking forward to that. That's good because there's a lot of detail to that um, as commissioner Rectal can attest. So, um, I think we'll need the time in both of those meetings. Okay, Chair. Yes, I'm sorry. I just didn't quite understand that. Um, we're going to have housing element June 8th and then uh, the June 29th meeting. Yes. Too? And and are we anticipating uh, that's going to be the, the full agenda both days or are we yes. going to have some other things? Yes, At this we're, point. we're reserving both those meetings for housing element. And we really want to get it done so we can get it onto council, I believe, in August for their review, the, the policies and programs. All right, thank you. Okay. No other questions? What's that? Okay, then we're adjourned. Good night. Thank Good night. you.